the theme of my talk uh, today is just uh, uh, how you can, you know, uh, extrapolate the information obtained from rare disease to the more general common disease. And uh, that's probably the uh, concern for a funding agency or something like that, that uh, you know, you know the, the rare disease uh, research might be interesting, but uh, uh, how many people can benefit from that? That's probably the argument that can be made at the uh, government or agency level. But uh, what I can, uh, I'm going to tell you today is that uh, uh, studying rare disease uh, can have a strong impact on the understanding of the uh, common disease, at least in my case. I can, uh, I, I hope I can make this argument today. So uh, 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 today I'm going to talk about uh, this in a heparin sulfate uh, disease caused by, uh, called laser. 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 Uh, MHE. Uh, MHE. Left here. Left. Okay. No, you have to use the. Oh, no. So sorry. Okay. Okay. MHE. And this is a, a bone disease caused by the mutation BXT1 or EXT2 genes. But uh, I'm going to tell you uh, research on <coughs> MHE uh, gave us some information about uh, the mechanism, potential mechanism of the autism in general. Uh, I probably don't have time to talk about osteoporosis, but that's another common disease which we get some insight from the research of the MHE. Okay, I can skip this one, heparin sulfate, protoglycans, this kind of in a molecule, and the EXT1, this is a gene I'm going to talk about. Uh, as uh, Jeff said, this is a key enzyme to elongate the heparin sulfate backbone. So without EXT1, there will be essentially no heparin sulfate produced. But this is a very clear-cut system, although it is a brute force, but a very clear-cut system to uh, determine the function of the heparin sulfate in vivo. All right, uh, so this is a disease, MHE, uh, multiple hereditary exostosis. And this is actually one of the most common gene uh, genetic skeletal dysplasias. And it depends on the paper, but some paper says one in 18,000. So it is relatively common rare disease. Probably there are nearly 10,000 patients in, in the country, at least thousands. And uh, the kind of, uh, main feature of this disease is the formation of multiple benign bone tumors called osteochondromas. You can see there are uh, one, two, three, four, five osteochondromas in the knee joint of a, of a patient. At the same time, these patients have a character characteristic bone deformity, such as in you know, a bowing of the forearm. And as I told you, uh, this disease is caused by the heterozygous in inactivation of the either EXT1 or e EXT2 gene. And the heparin sulfate production is reduced by uh, like a 50% because of its kind of haploid insufficiency condition. All right, so uh, previously we, we showed just uh, uh, two forms, uh, uh, these osteochondromas, the formation of osteochondromas requires, at least, you know, uh, not requires, but one of the mechanisms for the formation of osteochondroma is the loss of heterozygosity of the EXT1 or EXT2 genes. But I'm not, I'm not going to get into this topic today. The question is, okay, this is multiple hereditary exosomes. It's uh, mainly manifested mainly as a bone disease. But we know the heparin sulfate is everywhere. Uh, essentially, any cell type, every tissue has a, a significant amount of heparin sulfate. Then what is the, you know, the consequence, in vivo consequence, of the lack of heparin sulfate in other tissues? So uh, we got interested in uh, the brain and especially uh, the physiology and the behavior, cognitive function of the kind of you know, stuff. Uh, there are several reasons. Uh, first, uh, we noticed that heparin sulfate is enriched in the synapses. This is one of the dendritic spine, and uh, there is a synapse formed in this region. You can see the uh, heparin sulfate antibody is stained the top of dendritic spine. So this suggests the heparin sulfate is enriched in the uh, synapses. And uh, uh, there are actually several papers, sporadic papers, suggest that uh, uh, MHG patients sometimes, occasionally, associate a mental uh, symptoms such as autistic traits. This is just one paper. So we got interested uh, to test this uh, issue by knocking out EXT1 specifically in the excitatory neurons using this in a CAM kinase 2 CRE driver and analyze the uh, mice in terms of the battery of the behavior analysis. 
Uh, if you attended the, this meeting last year, you are, like, you are unlucky. You, you, can, you can leave next 10 minutes to, uh, for me to show the, show the data. But I have to show, otherwise, you know, second part will not make any sense. <laughs> All right, uh, first, we realize uh, this nesting behavior. Okay, these are the wild type mice. These are no condition knockout mice. You can see they don't form communal nest, common nest. And this is in actually somewhat similar to the behavior of the, these autistic kids who do not socialize very well. It's like these, these mice. So the, uh, uh, it's pretty well known, so-called triad of the autism. One is impaired social interaction, which suggested by the previous slide. And the second one is impaired communication, of course. It is a language communication. And the third one is repetitive stereotypic behavior, uh, such as you know, flapping or you know, something like that. Also, there are a couple of I mean, associated features in autism, such as hyperactivity, short attention span, and lack of fear in the real danger. So the question is whether these mice show a kind of you know, similar or related uh, you know, the, uh, phenotypes which related to these uh, or, uh, human symptoms. Okay, first, this is a social intruder test, which is uh, uh, one of the paradigms to test the sociability of uh, knockout mice. The top uh, panel shows, uh, uh, okay, this is a wild type mouse, and we are going to put the totally unfam unfamiliar wild type mice into the cage and look at the behavior of the test mouse. So this is a uh, uh, wild type behavior, okay. So initially, uh, he kind of avoid, but then uh, because this is his territory, he start to explore uh, by chasing. Okay, so the uh, next the next one is this 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 mouse is knockout mutant mouse, and uh, this is another wild type mouse, uh, totally unfamiliar. Then look at the behavior of this, you know, mutant mice, mouse. So actually, he avoids the contact. So she, he, he's kind of evading the social uh, contact. So it's kind of a social phobia kind of in a situation, I would say. So this is just, a, uh, let's see, oh, so sorry. Okay, this is just a quantification by video uh, analysis. Uh, okay, the second, actually the third phenotype triads of the autism is the stereotypic behavior. So this is a whole ball test. Just, just look at the behavior of the wild type mass. So he look at this hole and then go to the next one. He just got interested in what's inside of the, of the hole. hole. The, he goes to the randomly next to the next hole, right? This is typical exploratory behavior of a mouse. But uh, this guy, condition knockout, I don't need probably any explanation. So somehow, uh, he, he, <laughs> once he got interested in this hall, uh, he cannot, you know, the, uh, you know, eliminate that kind of, you know. Uh, uh, so it, it just just keep putting the nose into the same hall. So this is a kind of stereotypical behavior, which is somehow, you know, correlate with the human uh, stereotypes in the human autism. The third, obviously, is the language. But of course, it is difficult uh, to model language in mice. How do you, you know, model uh, language in mice? But uh, these days, it is increasingly used. This you know, ultrasonic vocalization has been increasingly used as a model uh, to language you know, defici deficient, deficits in, in mice. Just, just uh, uh, this is ultrasound. So this is uh, uh, modified so that we can hear. I, I just uh, uh, run the tape. Oops. Sorry. Okay. <coughs> Just a moment. Okay. 
Okay, this is the vial type. This is the vial type map. You see all the all the you know the uh, uh, vocalization. Okay, how about the uh, mutant? It is actually pretty clear from this chart. Actually, they can vocalize, but the you know, frequency of vocalization is much, much less. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, th those are the, you know, basically the uh, be you know, behavior of the community you know, uh, phenotype. But uh, uh, of course, we are interested in what, how these you know, findings correlate with the human autism. And uh, first, we looked at the diff you know, mice of the different phenotype, uh, different genotype. This is a mouse, uh, the genotype I just showed you, you know, conditional neuron specific homozygous mutants. So the heparin surface is essentially all gone in the, you know, only neurons. But uh, this is not a, phenot a genotype of the MHG patient. MHG patient genotype is this one, EXC1 plus minus. So we did uh, some uh, behavior analysis, not completed, but the, some of the uh, uh, social interaction is normal in the e EXT1 plus minus heterozygotes. Uh, but the hyperactivity is uh, hyper, right? And uh, uh, fear of the physical danger, such as height and the sound, it is reduced in all genotypes. So obviously this Conditional knockout is kind of extreme a little bit in comparison with the human situation, but even in the genotype uh, similar to the human patients, they show some behavioral you know, changes. Okay, and we did some uh, electrophysiology and uh, this is because uh, seems to be due to the AMPA receptor uh, in you know, the insufficient function of AMPA receptor. You see the spikes are reduced in the knockout mice amygdala. I don't get into that. And actually the surface expression of AMPA receptor is reduced in the knockout neurons. So we believe, or we you know, hypothesize that this is a, you know, the molecular basis for the uh, cognitive and the behavioral deficits in the knockout mice. Then, so are these findings relevant to the human autism? Of course, this is a very important question. And of course, we do not have a clear answer to that. But now, it is in a, some, some in, interesting evidence is accumulating. For example, uh, there are you know, several GWAS studies that have been done for the autism population. And one of the GWAS studies published in Nature 2009 identified this gene, HS3SP5, which encodes one of the sort of transferase, you know, uh, on, uh, uh, transferase for the heparin sulfate is one of the uh, candidates pretty high up in the list of, in at least two large cohorts of European autism uh, ancestry and actually replicated in the two other cohorts. So this is pretty strong evidence. Another evidence is uh, uh, this is a generalized scan for the rare copy number variation, which was done uh, two years ago. I published two years ago, I identified uh, four independent con, uh, uh, CNBs out of 1,000 patients, which localize in the GPC5, GPC6 gene cluster, which encodes the core protein, glipcan 5 and glipcan 6. Interestingly, this glipcan 6 gene was also associated with ADHD. And ADHD and autism, it's kind of overlapping, uh, you know, the entity. For example, 20 to 50% of ADHD cases meet the criteria for the autism, and uh, 30 to 80% of autism cases meet the criteria for the ADHD. So it's a kind of com comorbid. And somehow, uh, both uh, ADHD and the autism, can 6 gene kind of popped up uh, by genome-wide scan. So, we did some uh, additional experiments to, you know, uh, get some insight into the relevance of our findings in the human autism. One is the question: the heparin sulfate may be upregulated when you force social interaction in mice. Right. So in this case, uh, we uh, housed this. Uh, I, I think this is a black six mouse into the same cage 
or a separate cage, and then compares the, the level of heparin sulfate synthesis enzymes by you know, qPCR. So uh, EXT1, EXT, you know, or, or the sulfoprasterases, uh, you know, not, not consistent, but the EXT1 is upregulated by uh, putting mice in the socially enriched condition, and it is in the, I think it's uh, somatosensory cortex. And uh, EXT, uh, e, sorry, uh, heparin sulfate, okay, uh, 3ST1, okay, it is actually pretty highly upregulated in the somatosensory cortex as well as in amygdala, okay. And you see several other, uh, 6ST3 and 3ST4, and uh, 2ST1 is also, uh, also upregulated by putting more social, you know, the stimulation to, to mice. So this suggests the heparin sulfate somehow uh, involved in the, you know, the enriched condition, rearing is in the enriched condition. All right, then how about the mutations in these genes and human autism population, not the MHE, the autism population. So we got, this is really, you know, not, not conclusive, but we got uh, uh, 100 uh, DNA samples from the AGRI, which is the autism uh, registry, and the sequence all, you know, this is not a fancy exome sequence. It's just these uh, whole, you know, the PCR-based sequence of the entire, every exome mm -hmm. uh, of these, you know, four genes. And we identified one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, mutations uh, in 100 uh, autism patients. Of course, you have to compare as a frequency with a normal uh, condition, and this is a kind of preliminary data so far, uh, summarized. Uh, here is the frequency in the autism population, and this column shows the frequency in the control population. Of course, we identify several you know, the, uh, cases in the control population. We, ha we have tested, for example, for, for example, more than 300 control patients. Uh, in comparison with 100 older <coughs> patients. So the, it seems to be a little bit increased, and uh, we are interested in whether we can get some statistics from these data so far. Uh, at least for at least two cases, we did some additional biochemical and molecular analysis. One is this one. Uh, this is a duplication of the nine nucleotides in the EXT1 promoter region. And uh, you see, uh, this is a genome PCR uh, sequencing. You see the duplication of the, uh, you know, the two peaks, uh, double peaks from here. And uh, it's uh, because of this, you know, uh, duplication of these nine nucleotide in the promoter region. And in this case, uh, uh, messenger RNA is reduced by like a 12% in the patient's lymphocytes. I don't know this is significant enough or not, but. Uh, there is a reduction. In the second case, is a deletion of the 11 nucleotides in EXT2, exon 2, and it is actually uh, corresponds to the ATG. So, but actually there is another ATG down, you know, uh, several nucleotides downstream. So there is a possibility that uh, uh, protein will be produced from the second ATG. But anyway, uh, this is the you know, deletion part, and. Uh, we looked at the EXT2 protein in the patient's lymphocytes, it is reduced again, like uh, up to 20%, something like that. Again, we do not know the physiological f significance of these changes, but uh, there they are. Uh, there's some, 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 some suggestive information. This is actually uh, somehow relevant to the uh, general human autism cases. So, uh, just to finish up with some uh, consideration in the speculation, the thing is, uh, as you know, Dr. Green uh, told us at the keynote, uh, keynote talk uh, this morning, there is you know, uh, two ideas, actually. Uh, one is common disease, common variant model, and the common disease, multiple rare variant model. I just learned uh, just a, you know, a few months ago, so I'm not not correct, so please correct if I, my understanding is in wrong. But anyway, in common genetic disease such as you know autism, there have been two models postulated. One is 
common, uh, common variant model. In, in other words, a small number of common variants, common mutations, which is the cause of the autism. The second model is multiple rare variants. In other words, many, many different genes are mutated, but uh, 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 each you know, consequence of the mut each mutation goes into the same converging pathway so that, that they show the same phenotype. Okay? So it seems uh, in the autism field, it is increasingly favored that uh, this uh, multiple rare variant model is increasingly being favored. That's my understanding. So the, the, uh, when we got this data, we thought, well, I don't know, this may, may be relevant or may not be relevant because it doesn't explain the majority of the autism cases. But if we subscribe the multiple rare variant uh, model, then these, you know, maybe 1% or 0.55% mutation ratio may be relevant to the human autism. That's one consideration. The second consideration is that the uh, heparin surface may be in the crux of the con converging pathway leading to the autistic deficits. The reason I'm postulating this is that some autism candidate genes encode the protein that has or may have affinity to heparin sulfate. Like a new exin, okay, this is now pretty well established, which is one of the autism candidate genes, and its receptor is neuroligin, okay, and cantnap, okay. Okay, in, in case of neuroligin, we have, a, a, you know, in my lab, so that it has a pretty strong affinity to heparin, heparin and the heparin sulfate. New exin contains the laminin G domain, which can interact with the heparin, and actually, the CANTNAP2 also has a laminin G domain, which can interact with heparin. So this is pretty interesting. So in other words, heparin sulfate may act as a common modifier for the multiple autism candidate genes. This is the kind of most grandiose hypothesis I can come up with in terms of the heparin, role of heparin sulfate in autism. The so finally, this is totally anecdotal, well, not totally, but the fairly anecdotal. So that there have been a number of reports claiming that the autism <coughs> children has abnormal plasma and urinary sulfate levels. In, of course, it is sulfate, not uh, uh, glycosamine glycans or heparin sulfate, so it doesn't necessarily mean gas amount is reduced in these patients, but at least one paper which shows the, gag, the amount of gag in the uh, intestinal epithelium is reduced in the, in the autism. So this is pretty interesting. So the, again, the uh, you know, attractive hypothesis is that the heparin sulfate may, can act as an environmental or nutritional modifier if this observation is correct. So not just the heparin sulfate as a genetic modifier of the uh, autism candidate genes, maybe the amount of heparin sulfate due to the nutritional intake of sulfate or something like that can act, might act, as an environmental <coughs> or nutritional modifier for the autism candidate genes. Again, this is pretty you know, uh, far-fetched hypothesis, but we are interested in that kind of possibility. All right, this study was done by these guys, especially by the Sumito Tiria in audience. Actually, he has done most of the studies uh, single-handedly, and uh, we uh, did the support. And finally, I have to uh, tell uh, many thanks to the Eaton family in the, in the audience, uh, Craig, Susan, and Vincent, and uh, Sarah Ziegler and uh, uh, her son, Robas. They encouraged me you know, from the MAG Research Foundation. They encouraged me a lot to do this kind of study. And finally, Jim Weston, which is, who is a kind of friend of the MAG uh, Research Foundation, who provided the uh, initial you know, funds for us to buy the first behavior analysis tool. Uh, back in like seven or six years ago. Thank you very much. Questions? Chris, have you had the opportunity to look in public databases for some of these mutations? The thousand genomes database or? Uh, uh, no, no, not yet. Uh, you, you mean all the uh, I, I, I have not. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that, that's all I can say. Yeah. You, in the, in the um, 
in the studies we erased mice independently during the social situation and so the fluctuations. Is there any gag analysis on the kids that come out of the It's it just like, you know, you can see how. Yeah. Uh, that, that's actually pretty interesting, uh, the changes. And especially the rear thing, like this here. The three O sulfate may be important because uh, that the uh, GMAT studies identify the three O that's consistent with the other. Although, you know, I support the three-way three-way. Any questions? Thank you very much, Julian. Great.